where we left off was we had thought about double integrals. So we'd taken the idea of, of single integrals and how you can split the domain up into small strips, send the width of the strip to zero, sum them all up, take the limit, and you get an integral. And we thought about how that extended when you're thinking about double integrals. So if you remember when we were thinking about integrating over areas in the plane, we considered small area elements, we shrunk the area elements to zero, sum them all up, and in the limit, we got a double integral. And what we're going to do today is think about how these ideas extend to volume integrals. And so now, rather than just integrating over two independent variables, so when we were doing double integrals, we integrated over a domain in the xy plane, now we're going to think about integrating over a volume. So for example, we have some three-dimensional volume in space, like that, and we're going to think about integrating quantities over this three-dimensional volume. So the idea is the same as we did for double, same as for single. What we think about is dividing this volume now up into little volumes. And then we shrink again the size of these volumes to zero, sum them all up, take the limit, and then we end up with a volume integral, which will look very similar to double integrals, except now, as well as integrating over the x and the y direction, we'll also be able to integrate over the z direction. So the ideas go through. I'm just going to outline um, uh, sort of in a, a high level description of how you take these small volumes, you sum them up and you take the limit to get the volume integral and then the rest of the lecture will be using this and using some examples and also showing you ways in which we can use properties of what you're trying to integrate to make your life more straightforward. So we'll start being a bit more um, uh, informed and clever about the way we compute integrals. All right, so let's start then with an informal definition. So suppose we have some scalar field. So let's suppose we consider a scalar field. And now, instead of being a function just of two variables, so psi is our scalar field, it's going to be a function of x, y, but now also of z. And the scalar field is going to be defined in a 3D region in R3. And we're going to call the region R. So, for example, this might be our region R. Okay, so as we did for single integrals and double integrals, what we do now is we partition R, the region that we're integrating over, into n cubic or um, cuboid elements. And we suppose these have volume. So if delta x is a little increment in, y, in x and delta y is a little increment in y, etc., then the volume is delta x, delta y, delta z. So you might think of over here, this would be of length delta x, this would be delta y, and this would be delta z. Okay, and then we're going to let, so we need some values of this scalar function, so we need to approximate it somehow. So we let psi with a subscript i denote the value of psi at the center of the ith element. So it doesn't even have to be at the centre, but just as an informal description, we'll define it to be at the centre of this element. So we take R, chop it up into lots of volumes of uh, volume delta x, delta y, delta z. We take our scalar function psi and we give it a value on each little cube that we denote psi i, where i is counting over the number of cubes that we have. OK, so then on partitioning R into smaller and smaller elements.
right? And then taking the limit, so the same procedure as before, taking the limit. So if delta V is our little volume element, delta V, which we know is delta X, delta Y, delta Z, tending to zero, so we shrink them down. Then the limit, if I sum up over all those volume elements, so this means I goes from one to N, <coughs> of the value of my scalar function at each center of each volume element, so psi I times delta V, so if I sum them all up, then that is defined to be the triple integral. And so to denote that it's a volume integral or a triple integral, we use three integral signs. So that would be the integral over R of the function psi that I'm trying to integrate dV, which is the same as the integral over R of psi dx dy dz. Okay, so when we were doing double integrals or area integrals, if I wanted to compute the area of some region in the plane, then I just did the integral over that region, R, of 1 dx dy. So I just integrated the unit value over the, over the area and I got the area of the domain. And you can do the same for volume integrals. If you want to compute the volume of R, you just integrate 1 over dx dy dz. So if psi equals 1, then the integral over the domain of dx, dy, dz is simply the volume of R. <coughs> okay, so when we were doing double integrals or area integrals, we thought about integrating over regions of the Cartesian plane, but we also thought about cases where you might have a circular domain. And then it was more, more informative to use a plane polar coordinate system. So we had a radius and an angle theta. And we spent time thinking about how I move from one coordinate system to the other and how area elements change using Jacobians and how we can represent um, the same thing in two different coordinate systems. And of course, we have the same idea when we're thinking about three-dimensional volume integrals. And there are standard coordinate systems that we might use. And these reflect the fact that we might have a cylindrical geometry or a spherical geometry. And the problem that you're doing usually motivates which choice of coordinate system you use. But there are two that we'll use a lot. And so I wanted to highlight those. So there are some standard coordinate systems in 3D. <coughs> so the first is cylindrical polar coordinates. So uh, just to recap, cylindrical polar coordinates, you might have the xy plane in the usual Cartesian sense and the z direction going up. And what cylindrical polar coordinates do is you have the polar coordinates in the, each plane or in each z station and the z direction. So in the xy plane or any transverse plane, you would have the radius. So a point here would be denoted by how far it is from the origin. So that's the radius r and the angle around that it might make with the x-axis. And then you have the same r theta all the way up, and so you can tell where a point is in the three-dimensional space by its value of r, its value of theta, and its value of z. So that's a very commonly used one. And so in this case, we have that the x-coordinate is the same as r cos theta. The y-coordinate is r sine theta and the z-coordinates are the same in the two systems. And so if you're doing a problem where you might be integrating something over a cylindrical domain, then this is a much better coordinate system to use because if I think about a cylinder in this coordinate system, like that, 
then the boundary of the cylinder becomes very straightforward. It's just a given radius and the values of theta going all the way around. So it's much easier to integrate than thinking about something where the boundaries themselves are functions. So we're going to need to know what the Jacobian is. Uh, so you can, I'm sure you've done this before, and if you haven't, you can go away and compute it. But the Jacobian, which we denote dx, y, z, dr, theta, z, is just given by r in this case. So when I'm writing volume elements in the cylindrical polar coordinate system, then dv will become r, the Jacobian, dr, d theta, dz. So it's important to remember this Jacob the Jacobian here. Okay, so the second coordinate system we use a lot is the spherical polar coordinate system. Which is useful, especially when our domains are spherical. And just to remind you here, so now what we have, so if I draw my usual Cartesian x, y, z going vertically upwards, so x and y are in the transverse planes and z is going up. And if I want to denote the position of a point in space, then we define that by its distance from the origin r, the angle theta it makes with the vertical, and the angle phi, so if I drop a perpendicular down from this point into the xy plane, so this is the projection of the point into the plane, and then look at the angle that the line joining the origin to that projection makes with the x-axis and call that phi, that's the azimuthal coordinate in, in spherical polars. So then we have that x is given by r, cos phi sine theta. So y is given by r sine phi sine theta. And z this time is given by r cos theta. So you can see that obviously if I have a point in three dimensional space, r cos theta tells me how far up I am on the z axis. So that's this distance. And then r sine theta is this distance. And then you need the components onto the x-axis and the components onto the y-axis. So we have in this coordinate system that r is obviously positive, as it is for the cylindrical one, that theta goes between naught and pi. So any point in, in three-dimensional space could take any range from up here all the way round to down here. So that's theta between naught and pi. But it can also go all the way round. So that's phi between naught and two pi. <coughs> and now the Jacobian dx, y, z, dr, theta, psi, uh, phi. This time is r squared sine theta. So if you want to write the volume element in this coordinate system, it becomes r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. Okay, so let's think about using these as examples. So suppose we want to find the volume of a sphere of radius A. Now, obviously, we know what the volume of a sphere is of radius A, but let's use our approach of changing coordinate systems to show that we are indeed right. So find the volume of a sphere of radius A. <coughs> so 
So I'll draw myself a picture. X, Y, Z. So I'm integrating over this region in R3. So the region is a sphere, which I'm going to call R. And its radius is given by R equals A. So if I want to complete the volume, I just integrate over the three-dimensional domain. So over R1 uh, dV. Now, what is R when I'm thinking about spherical polar coordinates? So all the points contained within this sphere are such that the radius of each point or its distance from the origin is less than or equal to A. And then you take all values of theta and all permitted values of phi. So this region R corresponds to R less than or equal to A. So then I'm going to go into my new coordinate system. So uh, dV becomes R squared sine theta dR d theta d phi. So this is the Jacobian that we get when we move into spherical coordinates, spherical polars. <coughs> so then you've got to work out what your limits are. So we've just thought about what happens to the values of r. So we're taking all values of r between naught and a. So all the points within here have distance at most r equals a. So that means my limits are between 0 and a for my radial integration. Right, then what is theta? Well, it takes the values of theta, take all values between 0 and pi, because I can consider in any cross section at fixed azimuthal angle, so the angle that goes around like this, I can have all points. And so uh, theta goes between naught and pi. So my second limit is naught and pi. And then phi is my azimuthal angle, so this one. And that goes between naught and two pi. And so the advantage of using this coordinate system is the limits on your integrals are just constants. They're not functions. Whereas if I'd use Cartesians, I'd have to think about the fact that on the boundary, x squared plus y squared plus z squared was a squared which is, um, can be done, of course, but is more complex. So now you've got straightforward integrals. So we can integrate first with respect to r. <laughs> so integrating this with respect to r just gives us r cubed over 3 sine theta between 0 and a. And then I integrate that with respect to theta and phi. And that is just the integral of uh, between 0 and 2 pi, 0 and pi of a cubed over 3 sine theta, d theta, d phi. Okay, and then integrating sine theta, so this becomes, I can take the a cubed out of, over 3 outside, I keep the phi integral still going, so d phi, and then if I integrate sine theta, I get minus cos theta between naught and pi, which is um, 2. So 2a cubed over 3. Now we've got the integral from 0 to 2 pi of phi, so that's really straightforward because it's just 2 pi, and I have my answer, 4 thirds pi a cubed. Good. All right, so that's sort of just demonstrating how we can use this coordinate system. Of course, you wouldn't ever go through all that pain because you know what the volume of a sphere is, but of course that's not always the case. 
and we think about integrating over more complicated regions and having to be careful about the limits and boundaries of our domain. Okay, so suppose instead now we want to find the volume of a more complicated integral. So as an example, so find the volume of a region R. So this time that lies above the surface, so that's going to be given by z equals x squared plus y squared, <coughs> and beneath the plane x plus y plus z equals 1. So the first thing to, when you're doing these calculations is just to try to visualise what you're doing. So we're going to stick with a Cartesian coordinate system for this one, for the time being, because there's no obvious natural coordinate system you might employ. So here is my Cartesian coordinate system. And then you've got a surface given by z equals x squared plus y squared. So that's just a paraboloid. So it looks something like this. Need it. So it's a bowl. And then you're going to intersect that surface with a plane, which will come through something like this. So imagine that's a plane, not a line. My drawing is unfortunately not up to much. So this is your surface z equals x squared plus y squared. And then you have the plane, which is given by x plus y plus z <coughs> equals 1. And so what you want to do is find the volume of this region. Okay, so now we have to be quite careful because now our boundaries become more complicated. So, what coordinate system might we use? Okay. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is think about just one cross section of this shape. So it's obviously a three dimensional shape, and I've got lots of different y values, but let's just suppose I consider what it looks like in the xz plane. So here's x and here's z. I'm just going to take a cross section through this uh, domain and consider what things look like in that simplified. Uh, shape, simplified domain, and then add up each of those in the y direction. So if you think about y going into the board, I'm considering the integral in one cross section, and then I'm going to sum them all up in the y direction. So we're going to start with considering the plane y equals naught, so that's just i.e. the xz plane. Okay, now I can draw it, that's much more straightforward. So now here's x, here's z. So in the plane y equals naught, the shape of the bowl just becomes z equals x squared. So here's my parabola. And then the plane, uh, so if y is equal to naught, the plane x plus y plus z equals one just becomes the line x plus z equals one or z equals 1 minus x, something like that. <coughs> so if I take my three-dimensional region R, put a plane through it at y equals naught, then the slice, the area that I'm left with, is here. So if I can compute the area for every value of y that I'm interested in, then I've got the volume. I just add all the areas up. 
okay now this is a problem with this com particular computation so let's just do this one in the plane first of all is that if I want to compute the area I might divide this into slivers in the way that we did before and then any individual sliver takes as its lower value z equals x squared and its upper value is z equals 1 minus x but I've got to integrate over all the values of x for which this area is defined, which means I've got to work out which values of x I'm interested in. What is the what we call the shadow of this shape onto the x-axis? So if I compute the difference between the top value of z, which is 1 minus x, and the lower value of x, which is z equals x squared, sorry, the lower value of z, which is z equals x squared, that gives me the, the height of the sliver and then I add them all up. But to add them all up, I've got to work out how many values of x I care about and what that range is. So I need to work out this point and this point and how it projects onto the x-axis. So we call this, this projection, onto the x-axis. So this is the shadow of the region R. So you can imagine if I, if I were to take a light above my um, region of interest and just shine it down, then the shadow would be the area blocked by my region, which is the projection of the region onto the plane. And because I'm just considering one cross section here, it just becomes the projection onto the line in the x direction. <coughs> so these are slithers. So this is the slither of the region R that you're trying to find the volume of. Okay, so <coughs> we can integrate over the shadow, i.e. by that I mean we can integrate this area integral over the range of x, which is given by the range of the shadow. And at each point of x, so each value of x in the shadow, we take the difference between the top planar surface and the paraboloid. <coughs> so in the plane y equals naught, the difference would just be x squared minus 1 minus x. But we've got to do this at each value of y as well. So we don't just integrate over the x direction. As I said, we have to integrate all those areas of the plane in the y direction. And so it's not enough just to know what the shadow is in one plane. You need to know what the shadow of the entire volume is onto the xy plane. So that's the next thing we're going to compute. And that will give us the, the boundary or the limits on our integrals. So what is the shadow of our three-dimensional region R in the xy plane? Okay, so we've done one, we've done one cross section, now I'm going to do them all. So what the question I'm asking is if I think about this three-dimensional shape and I shine my light above and I work out what's blocked out by the light, I get some shape in the xy plane, whatever it might be, and it's that that I'm trying to compute because that will tell me the values of x and y over which I integrate. Okay, so to compute that, So to compute the boundaries of the shadow 
in the xy plane, then I consider where x squared plus y squared, so that's the value of z on the boundary of the paraboloid, is equal to x plus y, no, is 1 minus x minus y, which is the value of z of the plane. So I go up to here, and all the boundary here is given where the two values of z uh, are equal. So here, this is where the plane intersects the paraboloid, and where that happens is these two values of z, so this z and this z are equal. So if I can compute that, I can work out the shape of the shadow in the xy plane. Okay, so if I were to make that, uh, think about this shape, then uh, it's not immediately obvious what that shape is, uh, but I can rearrange it and, and complete the square, and I can rewrite this as, so if I complete the square, then what I end up with is that x plus a half all squared plus y plus a half all squared equals three over two. So that's just completing the square here and rearranging to give me this. And what shape's that? Yeah, a circle centered at minus a half, minus a half. So x, y equals minus a half, minus a half. So the shadow uh, is the interior of the circle. x plus a half squared plus y plus a half squared equals 3 over 2. So in the xy plane, the centre of the circle is x equals minus a half, y equals minus a half, so it's down here somewhere. And it has radius root 3 over 2, so it looks something like that. So what I need to do is integrate over the shadow the distance between the top and the bottom surface in Z, so those slithers, so that becomes x squared plus y squared minus uh, 1 minus x minus y. I think I've got that the wrong way around, haven't I? The bottom is the paraboloid. The top is 1 minus x minus y, that's better, over dx dy. So this is the, the height of each slither, and then you add all of them up in the xy plane to give you the volume. <coughs> right, so here's where it becomes judicious to change your coordinate system, because we now know that the volume... The, the area of the shadow in the xy plane is a circle. And so if I stick with Cartesian coordinates, as we saw um, when we were doing area integrals, then my boundaries become functions themselves, because I have to make sure that on the boundary, x squared and y squared are appropriately related. So it's much better to move to a more appropriate coordinate system, which in this case would be a plane polar coordinate system. And so to introduce coordinates centered on the center of my circle, where now this is the radius r and this is the angle theta and the center is minus a half minus a half. So I let x equals minus a half plus r cos theta and y equals minus a half plus r sine theta. And then the boundary of my domain just becomes r equals the square root of root 3 over 2. So the values of r that I'm going to consider are 0 less than r less than root 3 over 2. And the values of theta 
ratio between 0 and 2 pi. So I'm going from an XY coordinate system to a Jacob uh, to a uh, plane polar coordinate system, so I need to compute the Jacobian. So if I do that, actually the constants that have appeared don't matter, and you'll see that this becomes equal to r, so it's the same as before. Okay, so now we're nearly there, so now the volume is equal to the integral over the shadow of 1 minus x minus y, so that's the top height of the vertical slither. And then you take off x squared plus y squared, so that's the bottom height or lower height of the vertical slither. And then you integrate that over dx dy. Now I need to think about changing my coordinate system, but I've done all the hard work. Okay, so that becomes equal to the integral over the shadow, and I'm going to have to replace the x and the y now with my r and my theta because I'm changing coordinates. Um, and it turns out that I can rearrange this expression here to become 3 over 2 minus x plus a half all squared minus y plus a half all squared, which is looking promising. And then I can change coordinates. So this becomes 3 over 2 minus r cos theta squared minus r sine theta squared. And then my dx dy becomes r dr d theta using the Jacobian. And then I have to work out what my limits are, but I know that r goes between 0 and the square root of 3 over 2. And theta goes all the way round between naught and 2 pi. So then this becomes the integral from naught to 2 pi, naught to root 3 over 2. 3 over 2 minus r squared, r dr d theta, uh, which if you compute all the integrals, I probably don't need to do it, I'll try and skip some steps. But the first thing to notice, which often happens in these problems, is there's no theta in the integrand. It doesn't depend on theta. And so when I integrate with respect to theta, I just pick up a 2 pi. So I can put that out the front. And then I integrate what's left with respect to r. And I get 3 over 2 r squared over 2 minus r to the 4 over 4 between 0 and root 3 over 2. And if I've done all the algebra correctly, which is a big if, um, the answer is 9 pi over 8. You can check that. <coughs> so this is quite a complex one. You have to first think about what your domain is and then think about how you can use um, appropriate changes of coordinate systems to make your life easier. So the other thing to point out is that uh, over here, when I wrote this down, I was saying that you have to make those vertical slithers and you know that the top height is this and the bottom height is that. So to make the difference gives you the, the, the length, length of that vertical slither and then you sum them all up over the plane to get the volume. And what you're really doing here was integrating with respect to z. So you don't always know, you, you might not just be computing the volume, you might be integrating some scalar function. So what I really did here was do the z integral first. And of course, z, the, the values of z, the limits of z, depended on x and y. And that's why we picked up these expressions here. So I just did it a slightly different way. 
Okay. So in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about how we can exploit symmetries in integrals to reduce the amount of computation we might have to do or to think about how we might do a computation uh, with less steps. So we're going to consider now, so we now go on to consider exploiting symmetry <coughs> in various ways to compute the integral. So suppose I consider this example. So let's suppose I want to consider the example. So it's a volume integral over the unit sphere. So R is less than or equal to one of X to the K plus Y to the K plus Z to the K over the volume. And I'm just going to tell you that this number K is an integer and it's bigger than zero, or greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so depending on the value of k, whether it's odd or it's even, we can exploit those symmetries in that integram to make our life easier. So suppose we consider, first off, the solution when k is odd. So what does the integral, how does that behave? Well, we're going to see that the integrand itself is odd. So if I think about the value of my function, so I'm going to let this be f. So this I'm going to call f of the arguments, which are x, y, and z. Okay, now let's suppose I consider f of minus x, minus y, and minus z. Okay, so for each point in my volume of integration, which is a unit sphere, I'm going to think about how does the integrand vary as I take a value of x to minus x and there's similarly the value of y to minus y etc. So if I compute f of minus x minus y minus z that's just minus x to the k plus minus y to the k plus minus z to the k and I said k is odd so that means that I have minus 1 to the k which is minus 1 x to the k etc. And so what I end up with is minus f of x, y, z. Okay, so what that means is for every point in this domain where I've got f of x, y, z, I also pick up the opposite point, which is f of minus x, minus y, minus z, and they're equal and opposite, which means when I do the integration, they just cancel out. So we can use that to do the integration without doing any work. So the contribution you get from x, y, z is cancelled out by the contribution So by the contribution at minus x, minus y, minus z. And because the domain's symmetric, for every x, y, z, you've got the minus x, minus y, minus z point. So they cancel each other out. And hence the integral 
is zero. So that works because the integrand is odd, but the domain is symmetric. It wouldn't work, of course, if the domain wasn't symmetric because then you'd have some leftover points, which would give you a non-zero value. Okay, so what about the other case when, a, when n is even? <laughs> okay, so now let's suppose k is even. So that means I can write any k as two lots of some integer n. So i.e. k is even. Right, then I can use symmetry uh, to make this expression simpler. So we can use symmetry, which is essentially, it doesn't matter how I orient my x, my y, and my z axes. So I can do in x, y, z. So if I permute x to z, x to y, and y to z, and z to x, I get exactly the same expression. So it doesn't matter um, in what order I arrange my x, y, and z axes. So I'm integrating over a sphere, so it makes sense to use spherical polars. And if I'm going to use spherical polars, then I'm going to write that x is r sine theta cos phi, y is r sine, sorry, r cos theta. Nope, it's not, it's sine, sine theta sine phi, and z is r cos theta. Okay, so what I'm trying to compute is the integral over the unit sphere, so r less than or equal to 1, of x to the 2n plus y to the 2n plus z to the 2n dv. And when I go into spherical polars, I'm going to use the r theta phi coordinate system. So that becomes dx dy dz. But if I go into spherical polars, it's helpful to note that I can write this more simply as this expression, so r less than or equal to 1 of x to the 2n dv, plus the second one, which is r less than or equal to 1 of y to the 2n dv, plus the final one of r less than or equal to 1 of z to the 2n dv. So all I've done there is split the whole integral into three separate components. Now, if you look at z, it doesn't depend on phi. So of the x, the y, and the z, when I change coordinate systems, z is clearly the simplest that I'm going to have to integrate. And where I put the x, the y, and the z coordinate axes is somewhat arbitrary. I can just rotate them. So the way we make this problem simpler is to say, well, this is the same as this integral if I just rotate the axes to align uh, the x-axis now with the z-axis. So instead of computing each one separately, I can just do this one three times. So instead, if we rotate the axes, so if by rotating the axis, then I can show that the integral I'm interested in, so the integral over r of x to the 2n plus y to the 2n plus z to the 2n dv is just three lots of <coughs> the integral over r less than or equal to 1 of z to the 2n dv. And this computation is straightforward to do. So I won't do all the steps, but 
I'll just outline it. So this just becomes the integral over my unit sphere of z to the 2n. Well, z is r to the 2n cos to the 2n. The dv, because I'm changing coordinate systems, becomes r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. And then my limits, because I'm integrating over a unit sphere, r goes between naught and 1, theta goes between naught and pi, and phi goes between naught and 2 pi. And the reason this is nice is the integrand doesn't depend on phi. So the first thing you do is just pull out the 2 pi from that integral here. And then you've got sine theta multiplying some function of cos theta. So that's straightforward to integrate. And then you can integrate the r to the 2n plus 1. And so if you do all of that, the answer will be, and you can check my algebra, 2 pi over 2n plus 3, 2n plus 1. And you can check, so when n is equal to zero, then I just get back to integrating over the unit sphere three times, and I end up with 12 pi over four times three, which is four pi, or three lots of the volume of the unit sphere. Okay, so what you're doing here is exploiting a different sort of symmetry, which is when you write these down, the orientation of your axes is arbitrary. So you just rotate things, so the x goes to z, and then all the integrals are the same, but it's always more straightforward to integrate the z function, just because it's less complicated. Okay, that's a good place to stop, and I will see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning.